It's an old adage. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, thanks to research carried out by a team of Japanese researchers, we know one of the reasons why apples are so healthy. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we uncover the special jewel inside apples, which makes them particularly helpful for the metabolically challenged. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps, and other health horribles through better body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. Now, our team served apples and bowls of white rice to two groups of volunteers. The first group were normals. The second were people who were glucose intolerant. That is, they were pre-diabetic. Now, in terms of the specifics, the rice was a retorted product. That is, you pop it in the microwave, press heat, peel, and eat. The apple was a medium-sized Fuji apple. Now, in the study, the team mixed the order of the offering. So on one occasion, the apple came first, followed by the rice five minutes later. And on the second occasion, the rice came first, followed by the apple. In terms of the glycemic response, the order really did matter. Here are the results for the normals. The sugar spike is different. Now the open circles show what happened when the rice came first, and the closed circles show what happened when the apple was eaten first. Apples change the glucose curve. It's a little lower. Enough to write home about? Mm, no. Although it looks quite spectacular on the graph, when they crunched the numbers, the difference was not big enough to be considered significant. Think, think real. It could simply have happened by chance. So maybe you're thinking, well, why is she telling us this? Well, Odds are you're not in the metabolically normal camp if you're watching this video. You're in the it's not working as well as it should. So you're interested in what happened in the metabolically broken. And once again, it's pretty clear. Eating the apple first takes the sugar spike down and keeps it down. This time, the difference is significant. This is indicated by those little stars on the graph. Translated into plain English, the team is 95% sure the difference is real. But if you're like me, you're not all that interested in whether the difference is statistically real. You want to know whether it will make any difference when you eat dinner. And the short answer is yes. The pattern that they observed would be clinically relevant. I took the liberty of superimposing the graphs so you can see the impact. The maroon lines show what happened in the normals, and the black lines is what happened in the glucose intolerant. As before, the open circles are rice first, and the closed circles are apple first. Eating the apple doesn't normalize the situation completely. The sugar levels still remain high for a protracted period of time, but it puts the initial spike in the zone of what is seen in a normal, eating a bowl of rice. <laughs> so... Apple eating is not a license to eat bowls of rice for dinner, but an apple might be a tool to put in your tool bag, especially when you face a high-carb meal or nothing. Now, to be honest, nothing would be first prize. And it's what I would typically do in this kind of situation. The body chemistry fallout from a sugar spike just isn't worth it. Yes, it can be super awkward and very antisocial. The second prize would be to add protein, fat, and fiber to the meal. And this should be your standard operating procedure. Both of these are great options, but they're not always practical. Let's be honest, protein is not an on-the-go food. But apples are, and this makes them a great third option. Apples are a pretty easy fix. They relatively inexpensive, available all year round, and easy to eat. But most of all, they're transportable. They're small, they don't need refrigeration, and they're fairly durable, which means you can pop them in a bag and use it 
in emergencies. Munching on an apple just before a carb-heavy meal can offer a little respite. But aren't apples full of sugar? Yes, apples are not, by definition, low carb. And if you're counting carbs, your default response to an apple might be, hmm, I don't think so. Although, if you use taste as a guide, you could be duped. The carb count is often far higher than one would think. But not all sugars are created equal. Apples actually don't trigger an enormous sugar spike because the sugar they're made of is fructose, not glucose. And fructose has different biology to glucose. You can learn more about this here. And for the record, your glucose meter is not equipped to measure fructose levels. In fact, fructose levels are not routinely measured. But there are a number of studies that hint high serum fructose levels are something that goes hand in hand with metabolic problems. And it's not a good thing. Now, our team confirmed that the Fuji apple that was being munched on in this study was predominantly fructose by running mushed up apple samples through an HPLC machine. But it's highly unlikely that the fructose is responsible for the glycemic effects of the apple. Yes, the fructose might help give the apple a free pass because insulin doesn't respond to fructose. But the magic is more than likely in a pesticide found inside the apple. The pesticide's name is Florizin. Pesticide? Don't panic. It's all natural. It's produced by apple trees to stop fungal growth. It's primarily found in the bark of trees, but small amounts pop up in the apples. Now, the highest concentrations are in the peel, but it also shows up in the flesh. And exactly how much depends on the variety of apple as well as how mature the apple is. As a rule, the younger the apple, the more is present. Hmm. Fortunately, you are not a fungi. So the tiny amounts of florizin leave you largely untouched. Largely. It turns out that the protein responsible for getting glucose from inside your gut to inside your circulation is a little sensitive to fluorescein because fluorescein is actually a glucose molecule with a huge ring structure popped on top. And that ring gets caught in the door, leaving the transporter unable to move the sugars. The sugar molecules get stuck in no man's land. They're still there, it just takes them longer to get inside. So instead of a flood hitting the liver and causing panic and consternation, the sugar, well, it trickles in, enabling insulin to take care of business. But the processing of the dinner is now somewhat protracted. The glucose levels end up taking a bit longer to return to normal. Now, if you're monitoring your glucose levels, this benefit might appear as a non-event or even a fail, since the sugar reading is taken at the tail end of the drama. But this is not where the benefit happens. Thanks to the poison, the sugar peak is never as high as it might have been. So your body chemistry is better. This biology hints that it might be prudent to carry an apple in your backpack. Poisoning your SGLT transporter is a strategy worth deploying, especially if you're glycemically challenged. Now, just a note to point out, it only worked in those people who are metabolically challenged. Probably because these transporters are typically overexpressed in people who are insulin resistant. Mm, blame insulin. He impacts their deployment. Now, exploiting this biology is not a new idea. Numerous attempts have been made to bottle the apple poison and hit the drug development jackpot. But florizin itself is not stable. And at high doses, 
it can be potentially toxic. But it has served as the inspiration behind a family of drugs, collectively known as the glyphosins. They selectively inhibit the glucose transporter in the kidney, causing you to pee out excess glucose. You don't need drugs to exploit this chemistry. You can do it by eating apples. Unpeeled apples. No, not apple juice. The fluorescein content of apple juice will be pretty low because heating destroys it. And a big fructose hit without fiber is going to upset your liver big time. Too much fructose is definitely not your friend. If you would like to learn more about the biology of fructose, visit the library page on the Better Body Chemistry blog. And whilst you're there, take a moment to join the Better Body Chemistry community. It's a place where you can do more than just learn about ways to improve your body chemistry, but actually do it. In the Body Chemistry gym, you can get your questions answered, get feedback, and be held accountable in your quest to create better body chemistry and better health. Now, the tips and strategies that we share at Better Body Chemistry are simple to implement and always based on real science. Here is one of the journals I've used to tell today's story. Know someone who's metabolically challenged? Share this video with them so they can strategically jam that glucose transporter to minimize sugar spikes. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.